Major funding for these broadcasts has been provided by grants from Madison Realty Capital, New York Community Bank, M&T Bank, Amtrust Title, Customers Bank, Aerial Property Advisors, Capital One Bank, Sterling National Bank, Marks Paneth LLP, Meridian Capital Group. Additional funding has been provided by grants from Amarant Bank, AVR Realty Company, Bank of America Merrill Lynch, Briarwood Organization, B6 Real Estate Advisors, CBRE, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Chase Mortgage Lending, Citizens Bank, Collins Building Services, CPEX Real Estate Services, Douglaston Development Levine Builders, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Handro Properties Handler Real Estate Organization, Hodges Ward Elliott INC, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, John Casamitidis Red Apple Group, Kilroy Architectural Windows, Matone Group, Newmark Knight Frank, Optimum Window Manufacturing Corp., People's United Bank, Rockefeller Group, Rosewood Realty Group, RPW Group, SJP Properties, Stonehenge NYC, TD Bank, Terra CRG, the Maringor Family Foundation, and these friends. Healthcare 2019 urgent care, dermatology practices, venture capital, insurance companies owning them. What's going on? Where's the changes? Where do you get coverage? Where, how do you, where should you go? So today I've assembled this group of healthcare leaders and a lender to provide their insight on what's happening in healthcare in 2019. My guests include Robert Glazer, who is the CEO of ENT and Allergy Associates. Anthony Viceroy, who is the CEO of WestMed Medical Group. Eric Schweiger, who is the founder and CEO of Schweiger Dermatology. And last but not least, as I was saying, our lender over here, Mark Wegener, who is the Administrative Vice President at m and Bank. So how do ENT and Allergy Associates get around? And what do they do today? Where are you? So ENT and Allergy is 20 years plus in the making now. Uh, the group was formed in late 1997 when three independent groups came together recognizing that being small practitioners, small offices just wouldn't give them any sort of uh, clout both economically and uh, negotiating with payers. They saw the need for access to capital to make investments in technology and I would tell you that this is a slow methodical strategic approach to building a business. 20 years later now we're now um, 202 physicians, likely will be 215 physicians at the end of this year in 43 offices in and around the New York metropolitan area. Uh, we will see a million patients in our offices in 2019. And I think our strategy has been the consolidation of smaller offices into larger offices, being able to recruit the next generation of excellent surgeons and, and allergists and audiologists into the practice, being able to invest in the technology, in the EHR system, in the billing and collection system, in the call center system, in the technologies of the future to uh, enable our physicians to just focus on the patient. It's been a strategy that we believe has worked and when we're recruiting the next generation, uh, they all come to us first, at least in the world of otolaryngology and allergy. Anthony, talk to me about what WestMed. So like Bob's organization, uh, we were formed a year earlier in 1996, um, basically under the principle of how do we provide better quality 
uh, greater efficiency and a better patient satisfaction, which today is all about patient experience. So what the organization started as 16 physicians has now grown to about 500 between physicians and advanced care providers. Uh, we are a multi-specialty independent organization. So we're probably closing in on about 1.8 million visits a year. Um, our approach though tends to be large integrated clinics. So where patients have a need for say chronic disease management or for... Because you handle all spectrums from... Yes, it is very much this uh, process of we want to be where patients needs are and how do we do that at a you know, value creation to that patient. In addition, you're generally in a specific region, most of it, because it was Westchester Med was really the name of the group originally. Yes. But you significantly have a large portion up in the Westchester, Connecticut area, so we, even with satellites in Manhattan. So we are in Westchester and Fairfield County. That's been uh, thus far our primary locations little bit in the city and you know the future of expansion continues to be a very hot topic within our organization. So now we take the Mount Sinai graduate Eric, Tell me about Schweiger. Sure. We're a little newer uh, than these other organizations to my right. I founded the practice in 2010. So I had worked for two years as a dermatologist out of residency and saved up a little money and then took a loan and ended up um, taking my life savings and hanging a shingle in May of 2010. What's happened over the last eight and a half years? So a lot, we've been busy. I would say, you know, one thing we did initially was embrace the internet as a way to grow the business. So in 2010, patients were first finding doctors online, but mo many doctors didn't know how to target patients. So we understood that uh, what it meant to do SEO and what it meant to have early hours and late hours and really build the practice pretty quickly. So in 2010, lots of patients came in and we got fully busy within, uh, within a year. And then I started to trying to meet the uh, needs of my patients, hire additional doctors and then mid-level providers like NPs and PAs to grow the business. And in 2000, 12, we opened our second office in 2013, two more offices. And then since then, we've shifted to also buying practices as a way to grow the business. And we are now we're up to um, 50 locations. We have about 160 doctors and uh, mid-level providers and uh, 50 offices throughout New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania. So Banker, how do you look at the world over the changes of time of healthcare, in, as Bob said, in 1996, when they started, you started in 1995, the world to Eric's day today. How do you, how does the banks look at the changing world? Well, you know, I think as it, as it pertains specifically to um, large, you know, multi-specialty physician practices, you know, one of the key components that we look at is we want to see a, a, a strong management infrastructure that is doing the day-to-day -day business and letting the physicians focus on care delivery and at the same time there needs to be a balance and, and a, a methodology to keep those physicians engaged. But, it, but in the same manner of lending, okay, mm -hmm. when you lend to a regular business you lend based on receivables, you base on inventory over here, there are different assets. How do you look at the healthcare business to lend as opposed to the standard commerce and industry or the real estate. Real estate's easy. It's bricks and mortar. Right. Okay. This is professional service. Yeah. And to your one point there, it, the collateral, you know, is, is probably going to be limited mostly to accounts receivable. So we will look at that. We'll, we'll size it. We'll, we'll come up with advance rates that we feel are, you know, are, are we're comfortable with. We'll take liens on all business assets, you know, chairs, tables, everything, understanding there's limited value there. But I think more importantly, you know, we're looking at management, we're looking at the, the history of the organization to demonstrate that it, it's, it's, it, it's going to survive, it's going to be nimble, it's going to be able to change. We want, I mean, with companies like this, we want to see scale, we want to see, um, you know, management is paramount. 
and they're the ones that are going to you know be able to you know work with the third party payers they're the ones that are going to be work will be able to work with the large systems and um it'd now, be the, the irony is if you heard i said bob anthony doctor okay so here we have one as opposed to the face of the company what you may be dealing with the physicians mm -hmm. but in practice the ceos of the each of companies are professionals correct eric has a different thing right he probably has this, an operating administrative person but you are the you are the face of the company and the ceo yeah i mean it's a team you know i think i spend most of my time on the business side so I run the day-to-day -day operations, but I have a really good uh, team that we work with to accomplish our goals. How do you get the next ENT person? How do you get the next member to join each one of you? Bob? We have a very active recruiting program um, that I lead. Uh, we will uh, recruit in this year probably close to 15 new ENT and allergists. It's a very small community, uh, otolaryngology. There's only 300 residents a year that graduate a third of them go into academics. It really leaves only 100 candidates for everyone east of the Mississippi and everybody west of the Mississippi. I need 10 each year for the next 10 years. So I am active each summer. I travel up and down the East Coast and I meet with residents in training in, in Washington, D.C., in Baltimore, in Philadelphia, in Boston, in Albany, Chicago. Um, we are the largest otolaryngology practice in the country, so we're well known. I'm asked to speak at the annual meeting of the American Academy of Otolaryngology, one of the few physicians who's even asked to speak. But again, 20 years in the making. Uh, this was a strategy that took time to develop and a reputation that took time to develop. And for residents coming out of either ENT or allergy programs who are looking for jobs in the New York area, and despite, you know, New York being tagged in New Jersey as high tax states, they are an attractive place for people to live. They still are, and if people want to come to New York or New Jersey, and they're thinking about otolaryngology or allergy, they're likely to come and visit me first. Anthony, so I mean, because you're a multi-specialty practice, or a multi-specialty practice uh, over 60 specialties. We have a, an approach where we, you know, kind of this uh, think global but local responsiveness. So for us, it's about, although we're big, we have this mindset and culture where we put, you know, physicians first uh, and trying to deal with some of the complexities they're facing. Uh, how do we streamline administrative, a lot of busy work? We don't... Uh, you know, we don't believe in busy work, so whatever we give them, it's necessity for better quality, better care. Um, we have focused a lot in the last few years around building the right physician culture, which means our physicians have a voice in how the organization is going, what they would like to see happen. Uh, and we also share a lot of information with our physicians about the changes going on in the industry. Uh, what are we thinking about our future? How would we think about better patient care? Um, when I first came into the industry about six years ago, um, patients were important, but it was still a physician-centric mindset. You look at where we are today in this age of consumerism where patients can go anywhere they want. Uh, it's almost on-demand care. Uh, how do you grow your base? And I think you have to do that kind of in partnership with your patients, but also with your physicians. Which is a perfect question of how you grew your base. How do you get your doctors? I think, you know, it starts with our, with our mission, which is the ultimate patient experience. So we want to make sure that our patients are having a good experience from when they call to when they see the provider to when they check out. Uh, and to get that, we need to have the ultimate provider experience. So we need to have doctors and mid-levels who uh, really enjoy coming to work and have the tools that they need to succeed. So when we recruit people, the most important part is our network of existing doctors and adv advanced practice providers. So we need to focus on doing a great job with our current staff to make sure they're happy. And if they're happy, the word will just get out. Now we, um, like all three of our businesses are located within a, a small geographical region, which, you know, a lot of the availability of providers are interested in look at work living 
in a certain area. So if you're interested in living in New York, uh, New Jersey, I guess Pencil, uh, Connecticut or Pennsylvania, you know, we would be logical choices to, to meet with. And then for us, it's about um, being really high integrity. So fully doing what we say we're gonna do. So with, with our patients and with our providers, that means certain things, but it's about transparency with our billing collections. It's about a clear growth path. It's about opportunities to use all of our lasers and devices, which because we're a big group, you know, we have over 50 lasers and devices, which is a way that we can Right, which many deliver. practices couldn't afford, the same way that you have equipment in each one of you that the small practitioner couldn't. What effect has urgent care had on your businesses, the urgent care centers around the city? So I think, um, and I've, I've spoken on this, I think that we're um, overbuilt a little bit in urgent care on the one hand, um, and I think there's gonna be some retrenchment in that. On the other hand, I will tell you that urgent care is the new primary care referral for ENT and allergy. In the past where you had a bunch of internists who used to refer into the, us, um, those internists have rolled up into larger primary care groups. Where are we getting our referrals from now? More typically, it's a patient to patient referral based on our reputation as uh, good clinicians, uh, clinicians. But more and more, we're seeing our outreach to urgent care uh, centers like CityMD and others, uh, we're the next stop. You go into an urgent care center, they're gonna give you baseline care, and once it gets beyond that, they're looking to spin that patient off to the right provider. We do outreach to them, and, and that has worked very successfully. Before I have to answer something, I wanna ask the banker, how do you look at urgent care? I mean, they pay high rents in many of the facilities, in many locations. They have to have a certain volume of patients walking in you know, it's a true, and there's a lot of competition on the street. There's more than one urgent care center. I think it's like anything else. You know, you're gonna you're gonna pick your spots. I think there's a there's a business out there that is fundamentally sound for urgent care, but you know, you, there there are a lot of large physician practices that have urgent care components within their practice, and you know, we think that's that that's good. Um, uh, that that dovetails nicely. Which which relates to you. That you have urgent care within your practice. Sure. So, you know, I agree with Bob in the sense that if you look at urgent care um, on the surface, it's very much like a yogurt shop, right? They're on every single corner. Uh, but if you look at yogurt shops, they've all gone out of business. They've all, well, some, the good ones may stay around. Uh, we don't have that, right? So everything in WestMed is about integrated and coordinated care. So we don't have any separate standing urgent care centers. They're all embedded inside of our poly clinics. And more importantly, they're staffed by family medicine practitioners. So they're staffed by MDs. So when you come to WestMed's urgent care, you get the access that you would need rather than say go to the ER and spend a lot of money and a lot of time. You'll get the right level of care. You'll be seen quickly. And if you need a referral, so if you need to see a PCP or a specialist or need any type of imaging or lab work, everything is done right there for you. And patients seem to like it a lot because not only is it convenient, um, but it also was just a better cost model for them because you eliminate the redundancies of going to an urgent care that doesn't have your medical records. You spend money there, they don't really heal you, and then you end up in the ER spending money again uh, we take care of your issues right the first time. Eric, your thoughts on urgent care? I think if you look at millennials, you know, they don't go to primary care doctors. So it's the new model of, of primary care. Now, it's hard for me to say if it's overbuilt or underbuilt. I would say we get a lot of referrals from CityMD and other refer urgent cares, and they se seem to provide a good level of, you know, initial care. And... I don't think they're going anywhere. I think that um, you know we're sort of the second level, similar to, to ENT and allergy for the higher up complaints right. that they come into. What about telemedicine? Another trend today that's focusing certain the hospitals or have made a major investment in them. Sure, and I think that's when you look at millennials and, and you know future generations to come. The idea, perhaps, of sitting in a waiting room for a non-acute illness uh, isn't very appealing to them. Uh, so the issue around telemedicine is although WestMed has taken a leading approach of wanting to roll this out as a service, uh, you will be limited in what you're really able to diagnose. Uh, it's still 
predominantly new in more urban settings. I mean, in rural settings, it's been around for a long time. Um, the big health systems have obviously invested a lot of money around it. We're starting to roll it out, and we see it just as a natural progression of a service that we can we can deliver. If you have a non-acute uh, incident, certainly telemedicine could be a more cost-effective and more efficient way of being seen. Uh, and then if you need to come in, then you can certainly come in. I think the other difference I'll add for us at WestMed is that our telemedicine is staffed by the same family medicine practitioner that is also as seeing you in urgent it. care, right. as opposed to outsourcing it. So we have access to your medical records and your whole history. So when you use our telemedicine service, it's a continuity of care, unlike other programs. Bob? I think for our subspecialties, both um, otolaryngology, allergy, and audiology, it's tough to do a, a virtual care visit. It's just not, um, our patients, if they're coming in, they have real issues that need to be looked at uh, on site. Uh, so I, I think it's, it doesn't work right now. Uh, certainly in rural environments where you don't have specialists, uh, you know, in the middle of Alaska, I, th I certainly think it works there. Uh, I had somebody who we were interviewing who was doing um, uh, virtual care at night. Uh, she was taking phone calls from 7.30 at night till 11.30 at night. And uh, so I got into asking her, so, and this was an allergist, what kind of patient was she getting? She said, well, you know, a patient would call up and they'd have a rash on their hand and they'd take a picture with their cell phone and I'd diagnose them over the phone. And so I felt a little uncomfortable with that. I said, well, you know, I guess that works if they're, you know, in a rural area. Where, where's this person live? She said, Merrick, Merrick, Long Island. Uh, this is a very litigious environment. We live in here. I'd be right. uncomfortable. Significant amount of money from private equity firms have gone into health care, specifically yours. You've gone the other way on it. You've self-funded each one of your growth. Do you see more business, more uh, medical practices getting involved with funds from private equity? I mean, I think that's been the, the trend lately. And I guess we look at it similar to we look at bank financing as a, as a source of capital that you know, helps us um, grow our business and meet the needs of our of our patients. So, you know, we personally don't say this is private equity, this is venture capital, this is bank debt. We say we need capital to grow the business. The only difference is when you have private equity, there's a there's a life of a fund unless it's an open fund. Most private equity says seven years, ten years, I'm out. Okay, you either do a public offering, another private equity firm comes in. It's a different different mantra over there. Well, one thing I would say is I don't think the loans that are given by banks are, are finite, they're term loans. So they also have a start date and end date. And I think there's a misnomer that, you know, there's so much of a difference between different sources of capital. I think you have to figure out the way to grow your business and the, and the capital needs that need that. Relating to that, how do you grow your business financially? Bank lines? Retained earnings. Cheapest source of funding for retained earnings. Secondly, when we do have a need, we will take out a line of credit or we will take on some debt. But at WestMed, our debt load tends to be less than 4% of our revenue. Question, hospital affiliations. How important are hospitals to, to these large groups today, all, th all three of your practices? So I think uh, for ENT and allergy, certainly um, for tertiary cases that we don't want to handle, we want a great handoff because we think that's better ultimate care when we have a very difficult case that needs a, uh, a, a group of uh, specialists involved, whether it's a, a head and neck surgeon, a neurosurgeon, radiology, all those components under one roof. So for a subset of our patients, it's very important. Um, and I also believe for us, uh, our affiliations with Mount Sinai and Northwell and uh, Montfiore, very important in this market from a uh, visibility point of view, partnering with those three institutions. Uh, we've, uh, we believe it's, a, um, it's been a win-win for both. Uh, and I think at the end of the day, for our patients, we're able to get our EHR record electronically transferred over to those institutions with lab and radiology and our patients having to see those subspecialists and getting appointments within 48 hours. When you've got a serious problem, time is important. 
and our affiliations have achieved that for our patients. So Westmed Medical Group, as you know, is an outpatient service. Uh, when our patients, though, do require inpatient hospitalization, the hospitals become very important. I think one of the things that makes Westmed special is we house hospitalists, our own Westmed physicians, will sit in our hospital affiliations and will do the rounds on our patients. So in many ways, that continuity of care is never broken. So, and they will use our own EMR records and, and systems. So again, it's very much seamless from that approach. So we have White Plains Hospital in Westchester through you know, Montefiore relationship and Greenwich Hospital in Connecticut through the Yale New Haven relationship with Greenwich Hospital. Eric? We have um, different doctors have relationships with different institutions. I'm associated with Mount Sinai. Most of our doctors have a Sinai affiliation, but we also, have doctors at Columbia and Cornell, and I think it's good to be interacting with the academic institutions to, to teach and give back, but it isn't for us about referrals to inpatients as much like it is for some other providers. How important is it to you when you're making a loan that an institution has a relationship with hospitals? Yeah, we, it's, it's critical. We wanna see that there's, there's good, solid relationships with the acute care providers. To, to talk about healthcare in 26 and a half minutes, of trends, it's impossible. But I've been able to tell people a little bit about all your practices and certain trends that you think. And hopefully later on in the season, we'll invite everybody back for a part two in this segment. Thanks I'd like to thank Bob, Anthony, Eric, and Mark, and I'll see you next week.